This episode of the Paddock Pass Podcast is brought to you by Fly Racing. Hello and welcome to the Paddock Pass Podcast brought to you by Fly Racing. On this week's show, we're going to preview the Portimao Grand Prix. Steve English, Dave Emmett, Neil Morrison and Adam Wheeler on today's show. And uh, guys, we've got a, a lot to talk about this week. Dave, you know, Mark Marquez is back on the grid. That's uh, probably going to be something we'll mention. Uh, yeah, it might it might come up at some point. I don't think we'll spend, you know, more than, I don't know, an hour or two on it. But, uh, you know, it might get a mention. Uh, we we obviously recorded a Paddock Pass podcast extra about Marquez during the week just to get our thoughts out as quick as we could about it. But you know, there's a lot more than just Mark being back this weekend that's gonna that's gonna be in the news. Yes, Steve. Now, I mean, we dedicated a, a significant amount of time to talking about Mark and his return. So I recommend anyone who hasn't already signed up to be a Patreon and get over there because there's some good insight. Uh, we'll try not to regurgitate as much of it as we can on this show. Uh, but yeah, back to Portimao, one of the most spectacular tracks, um, you know, on the calendar. I think uh, a lot of riders would, uh, you know, state that it's one of their favourite just for the technical challenge. So uh, it'll be good to see if, um, you know, if somebody like uh, Miguel Oliveira can have the same level of superiority come Sunday. Obviously, Neil, you weren't around when we recorded the extra show, but uh, you've got uh, you got a lot of ground to catch up on now. Yeah, I don't know if you guys were doing predictions with um, <clears throat> where you think Mark will finish this weekend, but. Uh... Uh, yeah, I'm I'm kind of tempted to put a little flutter on them and maybe finish inside the top five, maybe even on the podium. Yeah, I think for me, I'll definitely be putting a few quid on Mark for this weekend. So let's get straight into it, but uh, we'll go into a couple of topics as well, just before we talk about Mark. Obviously, Dave, we saw Andrea De Vizioso is back on a MotoGP bike, and uh, this seems to be something that's really captured everyone's attention. Obviously, testing in Jerez on the Aprilia. Yes, it's a, it's a private test. There's um, uh, Honda and Yamaha are there, uh, Aprilia there as well, and Andrea Dovizioso got his first touch of the bike. We don't know very much about it. The only thing that I've seen is on GP1, um, they had a few sort of secret stolen quotes from him uh, where he said to have said it's quite an easy bike to ride and it's nothing like the Ducati, uh, which presumably is a good thing because it must mean that the thing actually turns rather than uh, has to be wrestled around the corner. Um, uh, apparently he spent a lot of the time just uh, short runs, um, getting the bike set up, preparing for a test, there for two more days, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, and uh, then we'll see after that. But you know, you'd expect them to do, actually do uh, do more real testing on Tuesday and Wednesday. Ed, could you imagine a debrief where Dovi came in and the first thing he didn't say was, the bike doesn't turn? been a long time since we had something like that happen. Yeah, or he actually looks reasonably happy inside the pit box. Uh, you know, that could be a, a change of scene. Now, MotoGP rider looking happy, it's uh, impossible. Well, the thing is as well, is uh, in the case of Dobby, it was only two days before where he was doing demonstration laps at Majora uh, for the first round of the Italian Prestige Motocross Championship. So I wouldn't mind betting he would have fancied himself, uh, you know, in the mud, even though it did absolutely pour down for that race. Uh, Tim Geiger, the MSGP world champion, won, won the meeting. Um, so he, he obviously had that testing day in Jerez, but, uh, you know, knowing Dobby, he probably would have preferred a bit of mud action. So I still have my doubts whether he'll be back full time racing in, in MotoGP. But, uh, you know, like Dave says, you know, there's, there's plenty of laps for him to get on that new motorcycle. Maybe he fancies the challenge after a couple of days on it. Neil, has Adam just broken your heart there by saying he doesn't expect Dobby to be back on the grid? He has, but, um, yeah, I think it was more... Dobby's manager, Simone Ballastella, and what he was saying at the first round of the season in Qatar uh, that was breaking my heart just because Ballastella was saying he thinks it's it's very unlikely we'll see Dobby racing um, this year. Um, obviously, there were a few stories um, that were pointing to Aprilia attempting to basically free up some funds or find some funds to pay Davizioso a salary to, to possibly ride a few weeks ago. Um, but Badistella was pouring some uh, some cold water on that. I guess a lot of it does depend on, you know, what Davizioso makes of this three-day test. Um, and, you know, if he thinks that it is a real challenge or maybe there is a chance of him um, stepping into the saddle um, for a couple of races this year or, or taking on um, a role as a test rider. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, he looks fantastic on the bike. Uh, the photos that we did see released from Harath yesterday, um, I thought, I think got everyone very excited. Um, and, you know, it would be a wonderful story if he did come back, even just for one race. Uh, I think 
obviously Simone Battistella poured sort of cold water on the idea of him racing because that's his job as a manager because the way that you get more money out of your uh, intended target is to say oh no I don't think he's going to be racing I don't think he wants to do that not unless there were certain you know circumstances um, and those circumstances would probably be denoted in um, uh, in euros are you saying that it's all down to money Dave I'm in not saying it's GP. all down to money. I'm saying that money is definitely... For a manager, we're, we're, it's all down to money. I can't believe that. Dave. Surely they're looking out for the best interest of their clients. That's why we see riders make the right decision on moves so often. Exactly. Dobby um, obviously rode his first Grand Prix 20 years ago. Exactly. Um, you know, it wasn't the 125, but he was a Honda man. I just wondered if that first Grand Prix may have been on the Aprilia because it could be like a nice narrative as well. For, you know, that, that probably means... 0.3 percent you know when it comes to the deal but uh you know the fact that he's jumping on aprilia to maybe resurrect a career that stalled um you know with the manufacturer that started it yeah he did he did ride in aprilia on his grand prix debut as a wild card at Mugello in 20 2001 and then ever since then he was always on on other bikes so it would be an interesting way to sort of bookend his career but uh, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how he progresses over the course of the three days like Dave said the first day was literally just to try and get himself back onto a bike get himself fitted and now in these next two days is whenever he starts to really push on so it's going to be interesting to see what happens with him Was uh, Cal Crutchlow testing in Jerez? I didn't see it he was because it was interesting to hear Maverick Vinales in Qatar already crediting Crutchlow for the contribution he's made towards the M1. I would have thought it was far too early for that. I mean, considering Crutchlow had to spend at least the first day or two acclimatizing to the bike, could he really have, you know, made that many suggestions to empower Maverick to a greater level of confidence and speed already? No, he couldn't have had, but... Yamaha won the first two races and Vinales won the first one so obviously you can look for any positives imaginable <laughs> they had a new catering staff potentially as well out in Qatar maybe that had a big impact Dave uh, uh, yeah no I mean it, it, obviously he didn't give any input which uh, would have drastically changed the bike uh, but if uh, what riders like is when test riders give the same feedback as them, because it means that uh, they, you know, the, the the engineers are more likely to listen. Uh, and if uh, Cal is saying, yeah, the bike does this, it does this, it doesn't do, do that, it doesn't do that, it needs to do that. And it's all the things which, for example, Vinales have said, Vinales will feel like, okay, the bike is more coming more into more into my direction. And also, like I said, a lot like we've said with Danny Pedrosa, that the job is uh, not so much uh, fixing things things as um, uh, throwing away the bad things. So, you know, like Cal is going through and going, oh, no, that's rubbish. Don't try that. And that saves work for the factory team. And Dave, I just want to ask you a question now before we move on to talk about Marquez coming back. I just saw a tweet from Matt Oxley and uh, Matt was tweeting about, you know, Mark, whenever we thought he was coming back in Qatar, Oxley thought, this is great. Qatar is not the most physically demanding track. It's an ideal place to come back. But then with the benefit of hindsight, Oxo was talking about how the tyre allocation meant that it just didn't suit the Hondas, just like it didn't suit the KTMs. This led to a spate of crashes for the LCO riders, for Paul. And it was actually a bit of a, a dodge bullet for Marquez as well in some way. Where do you where do you see that? And where do you see what's going to happen with the allocation this weekend? Obviously, it's going to be a much more traditional tyre allocation, a much more traditional weekend. Yeah, I mean, not just uh, a traditional tyre allocation, but the fact that you actually get usable data in the morning and in the afternoon, uh, that makes a huge difference already. Whereas uh, at Qatar, you've got that sort of one hour, uh, one hour a day of conditions, which actually similar to race conditions, and that's the only usable data that you have. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's definitely a good point. The the the, the front was uh, no good at Qatar. Um, we saw a lot of crashes by, especially the LCR riders. Um, the front was just going; they didn't have a firm enough uh, front, and the and the front at um, uh, Portimao should be much better suited. You, they don't have to make the uh, tires to to suit that particularly narrow window of conditions, um, which they did, which you know they had in Qatar. Like I said, Qatar is such a bad bad. Uh, uh, example is such a bad so it, you know it, it it doesn't provide very usable information it's, it, it's such a narrow window 
Yeah, it's a real perfect storm out in Qatar for that. And obviously this weekend is going to be very different. Let's just start moving on towards this weekend. Ad, what are you most looking forward to this weekend in Portimao? Honestly, Steve, I'm curious to see. I think the jury might still be out slightly on Portimao as to whether it's a, a fantastic racetrack or not. I mean, we see this frequently in MXGP where we have circuits where the riders love the course. I mean, for them, it's a real technical challenge. But then in terms of producing close action, it's not really that effective. I mean, there have been plenty of motocross Grand Prix that suck for racing action. But, you know, I'm sure the riders are having great fun, you know, trying to post their best laps. I mean, last year, Miguel Loyabeda won by three seconds. Uh, we saw a tasty battle for second place between Franco Morbidelli and Jack Miller. But then we didn't really get, say, some of the classic scenes we've seen, say, at Phillip Island, you know, in the past. So I'd like to see, you know, what exactly happens in Portimao, whether the teams will be able to differentiate themselves a little bit more because everything was very bunched, as we saw in Qatar. I mean, that was one of the, the big kind of news, really, or the most uh, memorable sights from the second round was how close everybody was together. So um, I, I want to see how, you know, we there are riders, of course, coming back that haven't raced at this circuit. And, uh, you know, I'd like to see how people kind of adjust to making their second appearance there. Yeah, and I think it's always worth remembering that in superbikes, we've tended to see an awful lot of runaway winners, just like we did with Oliveira last year as well. Dave, what about you? What are you looking forward to this weekend? I want to see people at a track which isn't Qatar. Uh, like I said, Qatar is such a very narrow, specific window. Um, you've got an hour a day where conditions are right, but then the you've got a, a combination of sort of a, a very abrasive track, um, uh, which is can be quite low grip uh, and quite cool cool and uh, Portimao should be much more sort of traditional so I'm really interested to see so you know we didn't see the KTMs uh, do anything good because they didn't have the front tyre we you know KTM should have a front tyre Honda should have a front tyre that they can use um uh, uh, Jack Miller had sort of some uh, a, a bit of bad luck and, a, and 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 partly a bad race we get to see how they go um you know he's got three sessions uh, of practice to actually get himself up to speed rather than just the one and then riding around a bit during the day in conditions which are not going to resemble race conditions at all. So that's what I'm uh, uh, looking forward to. Just It's not a completely normal racetrack. I think once we go to Jerez, which is a really, really known quantity, then we'll get a much better idea of where everyone is. Uh, but Portimao is going to give us a much better idea of the reality of the situation rather than the completely skewed picture which we got from Qatar. Neil, Dave just said three practice sessions there, which was interesting to me because that means he won't tweet this weekend about FE4 being his most exciting and most look forward to session for the it whole is weekend. That, it is that. Is, is, this, is, this, is this a massive thing for you now as well, Neil, where suddenly you can look forward to not having to read that tweet? <laughs> One of uh, one of the highlights of my weekend, actually, reading Dave's tweet on FP4. Um, yeah, because he's usually a pretty good man to to bounce ideas off during that session as to whether who is strong, who's looking, uh, you know, in good shape. Um, but I mean, I take it you guys have all lost your marbles um, in that you haven't mentioned Mark Marquez as the thing that you're most looking forward to this weekend, or is it just that you've already covered this topic in a, a previous show um, that you're deciding not to mention it? Because I mean, it's it's the big story, it's the big thing that been waiting for basically for five months um you know will he want to come back it's been a, a huge kind of um a huge story that sort of dominated the, the off season the preseason, and then built up towards qatar um and you have to imagine with the doctors giving the okay mark has had now a pretty suitable amount of time to recover um you know i think we're going to be seeing a, a fairly strong um mark marquez coming back this weekend and just to see how he deals with the whole thing whether he uses himself in gently or whether he goes all in um i think that's going to be really fascinating i tell you what i think it's going to be an absolute record breaker on today's podcast because we're basically 15 minutes into the show and that's the first time we're really going to talk about Mark coming back in any sort of level of detail. There's no way any other podcast has waited that long. So let's jump straight into it then, Neil. Uh, obviously, you know, we know that Mark's going to be fast. We know that Mark's going to be fit. We know that Mark's going to give everything he has this weekend. But has MotoGP moved on? Has suddenly that gap that Mark had to the rest of the field, has that closed? Um, I think a lot of other guys have certainly tasted um, 
the victory champagne many occasions since uh, Mark has not been here. Um, I think that a lot of people have, you know, certainly come on a lot as riders. Um, but whether the level of MotoGP has drastically increased, um, I don't really think that's the case. I think it's become more competitive. I think it's become more even. Um, but you could say that is possibly or that is probably um, a knock-on effect of him not being there and him not being at the front every weekend dictating the pace. Um, yeah, there's obviously some new names up there um, for him to fight, the likes of Binder, Oliveira, Mir, um, and then some old ones that um, he's obviously had a bit of experience of dealing with before, the likes of Vinales, Cordoraro, Rins. Um, so... Yeah, I wouldn't say the uh, the level of MotoGP has drastically increased over the last uh, over the last year. I would say it's it's probably um, yeah, there's a bit more depth there, um, but I wouldn't say that the the kind of the speed at the front has, has gone much higher. So um, yeah, I don't think Mark would have been watching the uh, the two races in Qatar with um, you know a great feeling of dread. I think he probably would have been looking at it, thinking, okay, game on, I can still do this. I mean, Neil, the thing is, like we said in, in the, the Patreon podcast, um, you know, our little extra show, the last time Mark kind of crossed the finish line was November the 17th, 2019. I mean, it's been a long, long time. I mean, yes, that season he only finished off the podium once when he slipped off in Austin, um, you know, which is an incredible rate of results. But, you know, I think that's, that is a long time to be ring rusty. Um, and like we sort of said, you know, the, we struggle to think of another racer that's taken such a substantial amount of time away from the sport and, and to come back. I mean, honestly, I really, really hope, I think Mark is the best Grand Prix rider I've I've had the pleasure to see. But uh, I think it's a, a bit crazy to think we're talking of top fives and podiums in his first race back. Uh, I, think, I think that's mad. Uh, my my prediction, I think he'll be, he'll be looking to finish in the points, get some points on the board because... While he would have looked at the races in Qatar and thought, Jesus, the Ducatis are fast, he would have looked at the World Championship standings and thought, you know, 40 points is not a great deal I have to make back. Um, so, you know, I, I just think it's uh, he, he'll be cautious and a little bit realistic. Yeah, but he's Mark Marquez. I'd, you know, even this is the Port of Mouse, Steve. Yeah, but do you really want to bet against him? If you've got. Yes. Let's put, let's, let's put your money on the table. If you've got £100 on the table, who are you putting your money behind? I, uh, for this race and this round, I will put hundred pound on the table and say Mark will not finish anywhere near the top five. Well, I tell you what, you're you're going to do all right with your Paul versus Alex bet with Cormac, <laughs> but I'm not sure about this one because the thing with it is, you have to remember as well. The last time we saw Mark, he was a second and a lot faster than everyone else in Jerez that race whenever he was coming through the field. You know, he actually crashed because for some reason he still believed that he could catch Fabio and make sure Fabio wasn't going to have his first win. You know, he had come from last to second. You know, he has such a massive margin that literally the only question for me is, is just his fitness for a full race distance. But, you know, Mark's going to go in and be fast in practice. Yeah, he's got to learn a new track. He's got to learn you know all these different things but the problem for it is, is we still don't really know what the level of that honda is because the only time we saw it pushed to that sort of degree was for those 10 15 laps in hereth one last year so i'm really excited to see what happens with mark but i'm like i'm definitely not going to be surprised if mark comes in and is still the best rider in the world i'm also not going to be surprised if mark comes in and is rusty but i definitely know where i'd be hedging myself towards with mark uh, if Mark Marcus doesn't finish, I mean, you have to believe that he he thinks that he has to finish in the top five. He has to believe that he can finish in the top five in his first race. That for him is taking it easy. Um, and I wouldn't bet against that. I think that if I was, uh, say, uh, someone who wanted to win the title, the first thing I would do, you know, someone like Juan Mir or Jack Miller or um, uh, Fabio Quartararo, the first thing I would do is follow him around during FP1 and give him a little nudge just to let him know that, um, yeah, welcome back, mate. Um, you're not going to get it easy. You're not just going to come in and walk. The physical intimidation may be the only, um, maybe the the best way of keeping him on edge because only by keeping him on edge are you going to beat him. Um, mental, his mental side was always his stronger side, and we don't know how much sort of fear is lodged, you know, tucked tightly away at the back of his brain. Um, and I think if you're his rivals. 
what you want to do is, is sort of open that little little nugget of fear and uh, see if it can't slow him down a little bit. Man who has um, intimidated people physically through his whole life advocates physical intimidation. Shocker, there, Dave. Um, yeah, no, I, um, yeah, I kind of agree with that, Dave. Absolutely, and um, you know, just to, to go on from what Steve said. Um, okay, the the precedent is obviously not quite the same as what what we're about to experience. But you know, the start of two thousand and nineteen, he had been off a bike for what three months. He hadn't even done any sort of uh, training and really away. Uh, from the track but when he came back for that first test at Sepang um, and he was still recovering from that serious shoulder injury I mean he was the fastest guy on day one um, and it was just a case of the amount of laps he was able to run that was the only concern so I don't think the speed will be in doubt um, I think uh, it'll just be as Steve said his um, his fitness and his ability to put a whole number of laps together and also you know the, the signs are promising yes Alex Marquez and, and Taka had shockers in guitar but you know, there's real potential there for Paul, despite the uh, the front tire allocation thing, despite guitar not being one of uh, Honda's favourite tracks. Um, you know, Paul could have had a couple of top six finishes if the races had panned out slightly differently. So I think, um, you know, there's a lot to be positive about. I think for the first time since Mark was a debut in the MotoGP class, there's too many questions around him. Um, you know, not only is his durability over race distance, but, you know, the first time he falls off, you know, what, how's that going to affect a, a little bit of mindset? It could happen in FP1. I mean, if he jumps straight back on and things are like normal, then no problem. And the other thing is, if things are not going well, you know, if, he, if he, he's not up to speed, not through any fault of his own, but just trying to find a feeling with either the tyre, trying to learn, you know, some of the secrets of Portimao, which the other riders have already sussed, I mean, like we said, we know we, we know he's been on, on there. Uh, he's been round there on another motorcycle, but the, you know, there's still a hell of a lot of work for him to do. Uh, I just think it's a little premature. It's a fantastic compliment that we're already talking about him being, you know, in podium contention after missing more than a year away from MotoGP. But I think the odds are really against him this weekend. It would have been better if he came back at Jerez. Yeah, well, Portimao is a track that does take a long time to learn the little nuances. I remember talking to Eugene Laverty about it, and Eugene was saying that even though it's basically been a home track for him, he's been sponsored by the track, he's you know worked for teams that are based out of there, and did an awful lot of miles at Portimao. He said it, he still learns little tricks of the trade around there. So Mark does have a lot of ground to make up, but he's also only got a weekend to make up compared to the other guys. You know, it's not like he's suddenly jumping into Portimao and he's never, you know, he's going up against guys that like, you know, if he was going into super bikes that were up there for 10 years or whatever it was, you know, he's going into there a few days behind the curve. You know, Mark can figure out roughly what to do over the course of that. He's had his couple of days testing down there on his, on his road bike. He at least knows the ins and outs of where the track goes, what to expect, what the sight lines are, all those kind of things. So that's going to help him a bit. But what I'm really interested to see is just his his mental approach to it because Ad, you mentioned it there like what happens on his first crash what's interesting when you talk to riders after they come back from a serious injury I remember talking to James Whittam about it and Whit was saying that whenever he came back after his illness he really was looking forward to crashing and being able to walk away from it but could he make himself crash could he what for love or money he couldn't make himself bin it and then suddenly whenever he had his first crash and he dusted himself off and he thought, oh yeah, I'm still in one piece. I'm still a motorcycle racer. You know, Mark's going to have that moment as well. And, you know, if it happens quickly and we see Mark sprinting back to the pits like we always do, then we know that the Mark has of old is back. And that's what's going to be quite interesting to see what happens when he has that first crash. I mean, three operations and all those countless hours of physio. I mean, you'd have to be some, you'd have to be remarkably delusional to not have any of that going through your mind when you're you know you're cranking it over and you're scraping your elbow so you'd have to be mark marquez <laughs> Uh, and it's not as if he doesn't have experience with this because, you know, like th this has come off of two uh, winters where he's had serious uh, shoulder uh, surgery where he spent every waking hour on uh, physio rehabbing his shoulder. Um, so it's, it's. Um, I think it would have been different if this was the first time he'd had a proper long layoff, but he came off 
um, you know, like I say, he comes off two serious surgeries, two winters of serious surgery, uh, and this is in infinitely longer than what he came from before and a lot less unknown. Um, but at least he had sort of the mental practice of knowing that he can't ride and he has to rehab before he can start uh, he can start riding. So it's not it, it's not the same as if he'd never had such a serious stop. Yeah, because like the thing with Mark is, and we've all said it, we've all written it, we've all talked about it, the only thing that was ever going to stop Mark was Mark. It's very unlikely that some, you know, more talented rider was going to come out of the woodwork and suddenly make Mark obsolete like he did to the rest of the field in the past. You know, he was lucky that Casey retired when Casey retired and then it was, you know, pretty seamless path for Mark, you know. If Mark was going to have his run come to an end, if his time at the top was going to come to an end, it was always going to come from a really serious injury. And that's where, you know, this type of injury, given how bad it was, you know, if Mark comes back and he's not Mark, it's not going to be a big surprise either because it's such a serious level of injury. But if Mark comes back and he still feels like Mark has of old, he's still going to be fast. He's still going to be that unbeatable force, I think. The, the, motorcycle racing is about 90% m mental sport and I don't think there is any reason to doubt Mark Marquez's um, mental state, his ambition. I mean, he is... His ambition is really the thing which sort of surprises and scares me most about him. He will do just about anything to win. Um, he will take any risk. He will go to any length. And even though he's sort of dialed it back a notch uh, to make sure he can actually win a championship rather than just this race, I still think that he is willing to push further and try harder and give more. And I can't see... Um, he doesn't look like any of that ambition has been dimmed by his absence from the track. He still wants it as much as he always has done. Yeah, and uh, you know we're going to be talking quite a bit about this over the course of the race weekend as well for our Paddock Insiders on patreon.com forward slash Paddock Pass podcast. And we'll be talking an awful lot about what we see from Mark over the course of the weekend, whenever we're in debriefs, what we see from him out on track, what we hear from other riders, what we hear from engineers in and around the paddock as well. So we're going to be able to keep everyone pretty well up to date on what's going to happen with Mark. But at this point right now, it's just question marks. And that's what's really interesting about it right now. We're waiting until he comes out on track. Luckily, you know, the podcast will go out as usual on a Wednesday morning, which means 24 hours later, we'll get the chance to talk to Mark during his debrief and see what he's feeling ahead of the race weekend. And that's what's going to be really interesting. So check out patreon.com forward slash Paddock Pass podcast to become a Paddock Insider and get our Paddock Notes show during the course of a race weekend. When we come back after the break, we're going to be able to dissect a little bit more about what we're excited for at this weekend's Grand Prix in Portimao. Fly Racing introduces the new FL2 glove. With molded hard knuckle protection, this race-inspired glove is equipped with palm and gauntlet sliders and touchscreen compatible fingers. Available in three colors and sizes from small to triple X, the Fly Racing FL2 glove is the perfect answer at the perfect price. Check out flyracing.com to see more. Welcome back to the Paddock Pass podcast. Looking forward to this weekend's action in Port de Mau. Neil, what about you? What are you most looking forward to this weekend? Well, I think um, obviously um, Mark is the the big story this weekend, but we've already discussed that a little bit. So um, apart from that, um, one of the things that I'm really excited about seeing, I mean, there's lots of interesting stories um, coming in to you know, the start of the European season. But I think just judging um, Yamaha this weekend and seeing whether what we saw in Qatar was for real. Um, there was so much uh, to admire in uh, both Fabio Quartararo and Maverick Vinales' race wins in Qatar. Um, you know, they both, uh, both of those performances kind of demonstrated um, their improvements in certain areas where we had previously considered them possibly quite weak um, and we do know that Portimao last year was just a, a real disaster for the um, the factory Yamaha team and for Quartararo as well who um, I think was suffering from arm pump at the end of last season <clears throat> so I think this is a great chance for them to prove that um, you know what they showed early on is, is for real um, and I think you know the fact that Mar Mark is coming back is really going to add to to you know the the 
need for them to be up there, really. They need to prove that, um, you know, if they want to be championship challengers, they have to be basically beaten Mark from the moment he comes back. So, uh, yeah, I think um, we're going to have to keep a real eye on, on both Maverick and Fabio because the potential is there, as it always has been. Um, and, you know, the Yamaha does look like a, a much more sorted package this year. So, yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to seeing. Yeah, because Neil, you mentioned there about Yamaha last year in Portimao. And obviously we saw Franco was able to finish on the podium. He was just beaten by Jack Miller in a race-long battle. But other than that, I think, you know, Vinales, Rossi, Quattararo with his arm pump issue, I think there were 11th, 12th and 14th or 15th for Fabio. Like, it's going to be really interesting to see which Yamaha turns up. Because even when you think back to Qatar, we saw the factory Yamahas were really good and the Petronas Yamahas were really struggling. So there's an awful lot of storylines about where Yamaha are and whether or not Qatar actually gave us a good reflection of what they can be or whether it was a bit more like last year where when it's working well for a rider, it's really good. When it's working badly for a rider, it's really bad. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's not necessarily... Uh a track that looks for outright top speed, you know, and you're not really able to completely stretch the bike's legs apart from maybe on the front straight. Um, and, you know, looking at the layout, this should be, you know, a, a Yamaha track. The Yamaha is, is, is handling well this year. The guys are able to to ride it in a kind of an aggressive way. Um, so, yeah, I think there's, um, there's every reason to think that uh, the two factory guys should be up there fighting at the front. Yeah, I'm really interesting to see. Interested to see what uh, Franco Morbidelli did because obviously he had a brilliant uh, end of season last year, and he had a brilliant race at um, uh, at Portimao. Um, but and Qatar, he was saying basically they'd gone all the way back to their uh, the the setup they'd had at the start of the 2020 season, um, which is and he said you know it, it was a setup he wasn't happy with, or he you know it was before that they were really really fast and successful. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do for Portimao. Interesting to see where Morbid Delhi ends up in Portimao. See if he can find some of his refine some of his form because he's been. It's sort of a massive disappointment so far this year. Um, and also interesting, if, as they say, the, the 2021 Yamaha is closer to the 2019 Yamaha, it's sort of somewhere in between the 2020 and the 2019, uh, then if they can harness those just sort of stronger points um, and uh, and be competitive. So, yeah, it, it should be interesting. Also, the point about arm pump is it tends to get worse as you go along during the season because your arms never really get a chance to recover. And so maybe having it at the start of the season means it, you're a bit less likely to get arm pump rather um, uh, uh, sort of you're a bit less likely to get arm pump um, sort of in this event Ad what about you what do you think of Yamaha's prospects this weekend uh, it's again difficult to say Steve I mean I think the guys are pretty much glossed uh, glossed over the uh, or not really glossed but covered the, the points uh, for Valentino Rossi of course it's a big weekend I mean uh, just in terms of not just results but also a little bit of confidence and morale um, you know he needs to be at least aiming for top 10 results I mean he's talked about wanting to do another two more years in MotoGP and, and assessing his competitiveness after a, a certain amount of races and we've already had two uh, so I think, you know, now is a, a time when he really has to start building up, especially when we go to Jerez, which I think might have been the scene of one of his last Grand Prix wins, um, apart from Assen. Yeah, and I think that's what's going to be really interesting as well, lad. And it's interesting that, you know, you were mentioning earlier on about how it's a sign of the respect that everyone has for Mark, that they expect when Marquez comes back after, you know, 18 months since his last Grand Prix finish, a year since he was last on a Grand Prix bike, and we expect that, you know, we're not going to be surprised if he's battling it out for top fives, podiums. Whereas with Rossi, you know, you're talking there about a top 10 finish. You know, Rossi's one of the best Grand Prix riders of all time. And it shows just where we are right now. And, and I think it's it's a good indication of, you know, the challenge he faces. And it's going to be interesting to see how he, how he, how he actually faces up to that task. It is. And, um, you know, you look at history, um, that second race in Qatar, doesn't really bode well for Rossi. Uh, I think there's only been four occasions in his, in his entire career in which he's finished the race outside of the points. Um, two of those, he had crashed in the race. One of them, I think he had a ride-through penalty. And then the other one was Qatar. So it was the first time that he completed a race without a crash or, or had a penalty of some kind and still finished outside the points. So, 
yeah, doesn't bode well for the season ahead. But you know, um, this is a this is a chance for him to to kind of reassess just uh, where he is. I think he's going to be using Portimao as a, a as a yardstick because I think it's still you know a new track. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns. Uh, I. Th- I think uh, Jerez and Le Mans and especially Mugello and Barcelona, I think they're going to be much, much more important to his future. If he's still slow at uh, Barcelona, for example, if he's if he ha- if he's outside the top 10 at, Bar- uh, at Jerez and then he's outside the top 10 at Le Mans um, and Barcelona, then I think... Uh, they he will quickly lose his desire to continue um but it's up to him whether he feels whether he feels he can be competitive or not um portimao is just there's too many unknowns it's too new a track for, for to be able to make a judgment yeah and the weather conditions are going to be very different as well this week probably compared to what we had last year in november as well so that'll be quite interesting as well dave it's going to be interesting as well though just because you know, we looked at qatar and it was the closest races we've ever seen, you know, whether you're looking at top 10, top 15, all these kind of things. It was up there in all the categories for statistical analysis of how close MotoGP is right now. You know, I'd touched on it earlier on. Portimao had a runaway winner last year. We also had it where you know, I think the bike that finished fourth, which would have been Paul in the KTM, I think he was 13 seconds, 14 seconds back on the race winner. Yeah, 12.6 or something. Tw- there you go, 12 and a half seconds, you know, half a second a lap. Like, you look at, if you're half a second a lap out in Qatar, you were last. You know, you're looking at it now where in Portimao it's going to be so different that if you're able to hook that bike up and make it work, like KTM did last year, suddenly you can have a really good weekend. You know, if you're struggling, like Yamaha were or like Suzuki were, you can be all the way down the field as well. So if you manage to hook it all up this weekend, there is the chance that you're going to be a lot closer to the front than you would be at, at other tracks where everyone knows them quite well, whether it's Hareth, whether it's Qatar, where they've done all the tests and things like that. So this weekend does have the potential for a few surprising results. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it, I don't think it's going to be a repeat of last year. Um, I think the field will be strung out because the field tends to be strung out. And again, you know this, Steve, in World Supers. Um, World Superbikes, you tend to see the, the, the field much more strung out than uh, at Portimao than at some of the other tracks, for example. Uh, so I think we are going to see uh, the, it strung out. But I do think it's also, like you said, it's one of those things where if you figure, if you can figure something out, if you can find two tenths, then uh, all of a sudden that's put you a lot closer to the winner, and that makes a big, big difference. Um, I think personally, it's not Yamaha but KTM that I think uh, uh, I'm looking forward to. KTM and Honda, I think they're, they're the really big question marks this uh, uh, this weekend, precisely because. In in Qatar, they didn't have the front tyre to work for them. In the end, the final weekend, they tried this, uh, or KTM at least, tried the medium front, and that actually worked a lot better than the than the soft front, even though it was very tricky to ride because of the asymmetric nature of it. It, it wanted to sort of throw you off. Um, uh, uh, the tyres in uh, Portimao are going to be much more of a known quantity. The track is going to be much more of a known quantity. There's going to be a wider range. We're not going to see everyone riding the same front and rear combination, uh, more or less. Um, so it, it should be a much more open contest, but that also means that there's a chance for pay, for someone to actually figure something out, find like two tenths, three tenths, and as you said, Steve, three tenths can be the difference between you know being twenty seconds off the pace and being sort of four or five seconds off the pace and finishing on the podium. Yeah, and Portimao. The reason why you have such a big spread of the lap times in Portimao is that the rider actually makes a massive difference, and it's not in terms of talent or you know anything else. It's literally just being smart. It's being able to figure out where you can gain a big advantage, and you know as an example of it, on the exit of turn three up to four, that little bit up towards the left hander that leads on to the back straight. You know that's one section where. When you talk to superbike riders, they figured out that when you short shifted, suddenly you weren't over revving on the entry into that left hander, and suddenly you were actually an awful lot faster. And it found riders a couple of tenths of a second just by doing something simple like that. And then everyone starts doing it, obviously. So the advantage is taken away. But it, it was an example of the rider being able to make a difference. Add, you're the only one of us here that's got the experience of riding around Portimao. You made a big difference whenever you were riding around there. It was nice, actually, Steve, to you know think about the corners you're talking about and remember how it was to go through there. 
Um, it's a thrilling racetrack. Fast and, I think, and sideways, Ad. Fast and sideways. That's what you were like. I think it was slow and straight up, actually, Steve. But um, it was uh, <laughs> no. Uh, you know, I think there are at least maybe two to three corners that are blind entry. I mean, it really is a matter of judgment, uh, track positioning. I mean, that was one of the big educations from riding that circuit was how much. I mean, the, all the riders look like they're carrying similar lines to the to the tune of centimeters. Uh, you know, on the TV, but there's actually a you know actually trying to put a motorcycle quickly around a racetrack you realize how much kind of variation there is for for points and breaking markers and tipping in it was a, it was, was a big education yeah i remember actually again it was during last week last year's race i was texting away to some superbike riders during it and they were all saying you know oh he's slipping that curb you don't want to do that or he's running a bit wide through this section they're trying to figure that bit out and there's a few sections on it where you know and and for instance, Term 1 is a classic example. You can't run wide at Term 1. Last year in Free Practice 1, everyone was trying to carry all the speed through Term 1, running wide. It was putting them offline through the, the kink and then in towards the hairpin. So there's a few places where discretion is the best form of valor and you really do need to just rein it back. And that's where I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens this weekend because, you know, some guys have that experience. That was a massive factor in Oliveira's success last year. Obviously, KTM also did a really good job. We saw that with Paul's performance as well. But, you know, Ad, this is, this, is a, this is a huge weekend for KTM. They surprised everyone with what they did last year by winning three Grand Prix, being competitive at an awful lot of tracks. We went to Qatar. They had the excuse. They never go well in Qatar. You know, they were first and fourth here last year. So they've got no excuses if they don't perform well this this weekend. And that's what's going to be really interesting to see if they can, you know, carry forward last year's form and show that 2020 wasn't just a really strange Marquez last season, that they are genuinely where they are. And I, I'm, I'm excited to see where KTM turn up this weekend. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the first of two talking points for me, Steve, I'd like to mention on this pod. I mean, on the last one, I think I alluded to the fact that Miguel Oliveira probably has the most pressure coming into round three, uh, courtesy of his performance last year. Uh, also, the fact that Brad Binder was the KTM rider that really emerged from the Qatar double uh, with the biggest rate of improvement. So, uh, you know, Binder, who had been struggling to that point up until Qatar 2, uh, you know, showed his, showed his potential again. So I think Oliveira, with his kind of new new old teammate, is going to have to really, you know, show he has the, the metal again at his home round. But this, the second thing also, you know, I'd say the Mia and Miller dynamic, you know, that caused quite a few talking points, uh, you know, in La Salle. Uh, again rears its head because there are two riders there with two kind of different scenarios to face in Portugal. I mean, Jack Miller last year, he was that rider that finished three seconds behind Miguel Oliveira and it was his second podium in a row. It was like his best uh, or most informed patch of that season. Um, after an arm pump operation and two kind of underwhelming performances for different reasons in Qatar, you know, what's he going to be able to produce? I mean, is second place the, the bare minimum? that he has to has to you know serve up this weekend and when it comes to Juan Mir as well we're now looking at a point where the world champion he retired in Portimao last year didn't finish a race uh he's now gone four races without a podium finish which is his longest dry dry you know spell in all of his vast time in the MotoGP class you know just over a year uh so you know maybe it's timely now for him to post a podium at a place where he doesn't really know how to make podium type speed so it's, uh, I think those two kind of narratives are going to be curious to chart. Yeah, and I think it is interesting to see how riders react to that ad. Because obviously, for Mir, once he had his first podium, he was able to consistently find ways to get podiums. And Dave, you always look at it that, you know, people talk about uh, pressure, you know, reveals the character, or this, that and the other. Pressure also breaks pipes. And if you end up in a situation where that pressure starts to build, and let's face it, especially for Jack Miller, that pressure is starting to build now. Qatar is a Ducati track. He struggled there. You know, Portimao, he went really well at last year. He needs to be able to react to what happened in Qatar, bounce back. Now, there's no question he can do that, but the question is going to be whether he will do that. Yeah, I mean, he's also coming off for arm pump surgery, which means uh, he's not going to be 100% fitness um, 
uh, there are going to be some some sort of residual issues for him, um, and especially a track like Portimao, then that can be really really difficult. Um, so I I honestly don't think that Jack Miller is. I mean, Miller is going to be on a weekend to just sort of like salvage points. His advantage is the fact that he was quick last year, um, <clears throat> so he's got a good base to start from. But I think he is, you know, much more going to be about sort of getting through this weekend, salvaging the points that he can, and then looking on from here forward. Obviously, they go to uh, uh, Jerez next, which is not a great uh, Ducati track. Um, but I think he has to. Uh, I think he has to have realistic expectations this weekend. And realistic expectations is not to go out and actually blitz the thing. Is to go out and um, just, you know, manage score points, get what you can. Neil, do you think was Qatar a blip for Mir, or is you know, this weekend <coughs> a little bit of a referendum for his title defence chances? Um, I think it's a bit early to be speaking about that. I mean, it's only you know a race ago or after round one that we were saying how Mir was riding like a champion and you know was basically one corner away from posting one of his best ever performances. Um, so I think um, no, I think Joanne. Um, it, it's too early to be saying that kind of thing. Um, I also think it, it's going to be interesting, as, as Adam said, to see how he reacts this year. You know, last year was a total disaster at Portimao for Suzuki, but there was the fact that they had just become world champions um, the week before. Um, you know, they had a big mad party, I think, on the Wednesday before the race. Um, I think Alex Rins went for the wrong tyre choice and Mir had a disastrous qualifying and then tried to do way too much on the first lap or the first two laps and, um, you know, made some collisions. And um, I'm not sure, was it a, a mechanic? issue in the end that um, forced him to, to retire um, but um, I, I would say there was enough in aspects of Mir's weekend at Portimao last year to suggest that he'll be a force um, you know on paper it shouldn't be a bad track for Suzuki um, and you know last year had that sort of end of year feel where you know if you were just a little bit off um, then you know you, you were really punished for it so um, yeah, I think Mir could be could be one of the guys in the mix for the podium this weekend. Um, but I still think if you're looking at favourites, Miguel Oliveira just going off last year, you know, has to start as the pre-race favourite because it, it was quite rare last year we saw a race as dominant as uh, what Miguel produced. Yeah, he seemed to just have everything together last where, last year. He was quick right from the start and, um, you know, really pulled it off in the race. Uh, as for Juan Mir, I also wonder whether the fact that he had wrapped up the championship at the previous race, that we talked about pressure, you know, that is such a release um, that it must be difficult to build yourself back up again to go into like a normal race weekend, which doesn't really matter or it, it doesn't have the same pressure on it as all of the others where you've been so focused so totally focused on trying to win the championship yeah and i also feel we don't quite know the full story of what happened to mir in the second race in qatar because he he basically said there was a problem um that he didn't want to talk about um in his debrief after the race and then we saw his crew chief frankie carcetti also mentioning like you know from the first couple of laps it was clear that it wasn't going to be our day so we might find out a little bit more about what um sort of afflicted me that wasn't jack miller in uh, the doha gp um when he speaks to the press on thursday yeah because neil we also saw a lot of uncharacteristic aggression from mir during the course of qatar too we saw that he was you know diving on a few people like obviously the miller incident is the one that got the headlines but we saw quite a few other incidents during the course of the race where he was a little bit loose so he was clearly overriding to try and make up for some issues so it is going to be interesting to see how he can recover from that and what suzuki learned from it yeah he was hinting hinting that it was uh, possibly a rear tire issue, um, and we know that um, you know several people were having issues with uh, with some of the rear tires um, in Qatar. So um, you know whether it was that, and whether they've had a bit more time to to analyze the the problem between Qatar and here. Um, yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll find out more this weekend. Yeah, another reason why you should uh, tune into our paddock notes. Always patreon.com forward slash paddock pass podcast where you can become a paddock insider to get those paddock notes during the course of the race weekend. We're going to finish today's show with uh, a few predictions. So it doesn't have to be who's going to win the race, guys. It can be anything you want. What are you looking forward to seeing happen this weekend? Dave, what about you? Is there any rider where you're really focusing on them and uh, what the outcome could be? 
Um, I mean, apart from Mark Marquez, obviously, who, who is going to finish in the top five, uh, I think, yeah, like, Ad's, I, Ad's eyes have just gone to heaven, David. Though. <laughs> That's right. Maybe he's looking for Mark up there. <laughs> um, I, again, I think, like, I'm looking for, uh, I'm really looking at the KTMs this weekend, the KTMs and the Hondas, uh, to, to see how Paul Espargaro is going to go, and I'm looking at how Miguel Oliveira, uh, I really think that Miguel Oliveira stands a very good chance of winning again. He was superb last year. Uh, this year, he's kind of, you know, they're, they're coming off a difficult race in Qatar, um, but um, Oliveira looks more of a complete rider this year as well. He seems to have grown in stature. I think being in the factory team, team suits him um he does uh, he, he's doing well he's got the right people around him so yeah i i will be interesting i'll be interested to see i think he's going to win um if i had to put money on him or on someone winning i think it would be uh, miguel Oliveira, um and that i think changes the complexion of the championship because all of a sudden we've got a you know a greater mix of of bikes at the front yeah, Dave, you should never put your money on on the Wednesday before a Grand Prix. The bookies don't really change their odds over the course of the race week. So wait and see how the practice sessions go. What about you, Ad? What are you looking forward to? Or what's your prediction for this weekend? I think we'll see a KTM on the podium. Uh, I think we'll see a Jacassi winner. Uh, see, I'm keeping nice and vague here, Steve. Yeah, which uh, one? There are six so. of like them. Uh, like yeah, there, there are six of them, you know. They're he thinks one. Luca Marini's going to be on the podium. I like that, Ad. That's a nice, aggressive <laughs> prediction. Or, or Adam's Adam's favorite, uh, the Martinator. I think that's who you're, that's who you're tipping. <laughs> um, on on a serious note, uh, I would like to see the uh, burgeoning kind of hype around Ralph Fernandez. Will that continue? Considering this is where he won uh, last year, uh, you know. So let's see what he can do on a Moto Two bike. Uh, Pedro Acosta as well. I think you know. Will this? Will he kind of? submerge himself back into the pack or would he still be setting the pace in motor three that's another question to 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 look for but um yeah it's it's, it's going to be exciting times i think um you know i'm like dave mentioned right at the top of the show it's going to be fantastic to see a grand prix bike that's somewhere not apart from the cell and qatar that's that's going to be the biggest thing I'm actually going to jump in now with mine, Ad, because my prediction or what I'm looking forward to this weekend is Raul Fernandez, because last year in Qatar, he had pole fastest lap, led every lap of the race and dominated by about six seconds. And now you're seeing a lot of people already saying he's been linked with MotoGP seats, Ducati's interested in him, Aprilia's interested in him. The pressure starts to ramp up. And, you know, when you look back over the years, we've seen Vinales, Rins, Whoever you want to look at in the Moto2 class that's gone straight on to MotoGP, they all won races in their first four starts in the Moto2 class. And now Fernandez needs to pick up a race win to really be able to build on that momentum, get himself sorted with a MotoGP contract, go one and done in Moto2 and move straight into MotoGP. And I'm interested to see how he deals with that because we saw some great racing in, in Portimao last year in the Moto2 class. You know, he's up against Sam Lowe's, who's got lots of confidence and loves Portimao. He's up against Remy Gardner, who won there last year. You know, I think it's going to be a great Moto2 race. There was uh, some reporting in the uh, Spanish press that um, Fernandez has uh, an option with KTM to go to MotoGP in 2023, uh, and that option also includes the the option to match any offer made by other manufacturers. And that there had been sort of like the very first contacts from I think uh, Aprilia, uh, Yamaha, and Ducati. So yeah, I mean that's the, the first contacts is literally just so you know what do you think about next year. Um, that's not really the same as having a concrete offer. So I, I think they're going to wait. They'll, they'll hold off a little bit before sort of uh, sliding a contract his way. But uh, yeah, he, like the hype is real uh, around him. So it's going to be interesting to see how he does in the next few races. But apparently, uh, Raul has no wars, uh, Dave, on that magic on that subject. Yeah. And um, also, I've just had a message in, and, and Romano Fernati has calmed down finally uh, after his penalty from Qatar, and he'll be in the podium shout for Moto Three. Oh God! I, uh, someday you're going to double down on this Fernati bet, and it's going to pay off. Neil, just out of curiosity, what do you make of the Moto Three and Moto Two class right now as well? Because obviously, Fernandez, we saw what he could do in terms of outright pace 
or outright speed in Moto3. He's gone to Los Ailes. He's had, you know, a good winter of testing. He's had a few days testing in Los Ailes as well. Back-to-back race weekends. He's with a really top-class team. And, you know, it's important for him to kick on from that. You know, we see lots of riders with lots of Moto3 experience move to the intermediate class or 125 experience, moved to 250 class in the past and immediately managed to be a front runner. And Fernandez looks like he's capable of doing that as well. But this weekend's important. Uh, it is important. But um, I would also say that uh, he's up against Sam Lowe's and Remy Gardner, who are excellent at, uh, at Portimao. And, you know, those guys are, are kind of riding as well as they ever have done. So, um, you know, Fernandez will have to do something really, really special to beat those guys. But, you know, let's not uh, get ahead of ourselves here. It's only his third Moto2 race. If he's up fighting for the podium, you know, it's a, it's a great achievement. Um, you know, I don't think there's any real rush. I think Fernandez has shown the the talent that he is. Um, and I don't think there's any real rush like, for him to, to go out and win a Moto2 race um, in the next the next few audience that we have. Um, keep doing what he's been doing, you know, qualifying well and um, in and around the podium fight. I think that's, uh, you know, that'll be enough. MotoGP teams know about his talent and about his work ethic. Yeah, and I think that's that, that's a good point, Neil. Like, I think for me, it's just going to be interesting to see how he reacts to the increase in pressure and that you come back to Europe and how he deals with that. It, it, you know, we talked about this after the Qatar Grand Prix on the show, that KTM's embarrassment of riches, I think, Dave, that made them the big winner for you from the second race in Qatar. And it's going to be interesting to see how they carry on from that. But Neil, what about you? What's your big prediction for the weekend? Um, I think that... Miguel Oliveira is going to start the MotoGP race as favourite. I think Moto2 is going to be a great, great fight between Sam Lowe's and Remy Gardner. And Pedro Acosta, I think, scored his first uh, win in the FIM Junior World Championship Moto3. Oh, that's the wrong order. Damn it. It's not just Adam that can't uh, can't get it right. Uh, hey boys, I, I'll tell you what, I need to get it right for a couple of weeks' time whenever I'm down in Estoril <laughs> the week after Portimao. The, uh, the Junior Moto3 World Championship, I'll, I'll just say that. He got his first win in that series uh, at Portimao last year. So, um, you know, Acosta does have experience of this track and has experience of winning there. So uh, it's going to be really interesting to see what Acosta can do as well. Yeah, the FIM CEV Repsol Moto3 Junior World Championship. I really need to make sure I get that right in a couple of weeks' time. Um, I'm, I'm excited for this weekend. I think it's going to be a really good weekend. We're going to make sure that for our Patreon supporters that we've got the Paddock Notes show all the way through the weekend because you know we want to be able to make sure that we cover what's happening with Mark right from Thursday. So we'll have a show on Thursday just to basically give a quick overview of what Mark had to say for coming back and uh, you know if there's any more information that we have at that point. And then through the course of the weekend, we'll be able to do the Paddock Note show as well just for our Patreon supporters. So we look forward to keeping everyone up to date with that over the course of the race weekend. From myself, Steve English, from David Emmett, Neil Morrison, Adam Wheeler, a big thank you to everyone for listening to today's show. Be sure to drop us a message at Paddock Pass Pod with your feedback from the show or if you have any questions during the course of the Grand Prix weekend as well and we'll make sure to get them answered on next week's show so until the next time on the Paddock Pass podcast a big thank you for listening this episode of the Paddock Pass podcast was produced by Jensen Beeler David Emmett Steve English Neil Morrison and Adam Wheeler it was edited by Brian Burnett music is provided by The Liberty all inquiries can be sent via email to team at paddockpasspodcast.com <laughs>